And um, well, uh, Lars Krutak is a tattoo anthropologist and a photographer and a writer. He has written many books and articles on different cultures and their body art. He pro uh, produced and hosted the 10 part documentary uh, series Tattoo Hunter, in which he investigates Asian body modification rituals from around the world. And you can still find these on YouTube. Uh, he has worked as an archaeologist and repatriation case officer at the National Museum of the American Indian and National Museum of, Nat uh, of Natural History and as a research associate at the Museum of International Folk Art in Santa Fe. And he will now talk at this lecture about the ancient history of the tradition of the Arctic. Well, I give the word to you, Lars. All right, thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, first off, I would like to thank Finette Lemaire with a beautiful introduction and Gallery Lemaire for hosting my talk today and also the Amsterdam Travel Art Fair. Um, although we wish this could be in person, um, I am very pleased to share a bit of my research today with you virtually. And perhaps in the future, I might see you in the flesh at the Tribal Art Fair itself. Um, but before I begin, I just wanna briefly note that this presentation is based on 20 plus years of research on prehistoric ivory figurines from the Bering Strait region. Um, Although it draws on aspects of several of my publications over the years, including my first journal article in 1999, way back when, that's how old I am, <laughs> uh, it leans somewhat heavily on a recent book chapter uh, in the edit, edited volume Ancient Ink, you can see the cover right here, um, published by the University of Washington Press, co-edited by myself and my colleague Aaron Dieter Wolf. Um, and now with those remarks sort of out of the way, um, I'd like to sort of move on to the lecture. Give me a moment. Beginning in the late 19th century around Bering Strait, where Siberia and Alaska nearly meet, ornate pieces of carved fossil ivory bearing decorations unlike anything previously known from what was then called the Eskimo region, began appearing in museum collections. These small, deeply patented artifacts, which originated from ancient village sites across the region and passed from the pockets of indigenous collectors to American whalers, teachers, traders, and museum curators, were evidence of a distinctive and scarcely known prehistoric maritime culture of Northwestern Alaska and neighboring Siberia. Beautifully incised harpoon heads and socket pieces, animated zoomorphic drum and box handles, and other objects of unknown use were created by one or more prehistoric societies that appear to have been centered on St. Lawrence Island, Alaska, parts of the adjacent Asiatic coast, the Diomede Islands directly in Bering Strait, and portions of the Seward Peninsula of Alaska. Now, by the mid-1920s, anthropological interest in the origins of these Paleo-Inuit peoples peaked, resulting in a series of archaeological expeditions to the Bering Strait that actually continue to this day. On St. Lawrence Island and the neighboring Chukotka Peninsula of Russia, excavations revealed a succession of closely related and partially overlapping cultures, the Old Bering Sea, approximately 200 BC to 800 AD, depending on the site, and the Punic culture from 800 to 1200 AD, whose settlements and cemeteries exhibited some of the finest art ever produced by hunting societies. Lured to the Bering Strait by vast herds of ivory-bearing sea mammals like walruses and large whales that provided meat and many raw materials, these maritime peoples from Asia were led by male and female shamans, whaling captains, and notable warriors. Both men and women of these peoples tattooed their bodies and crafted human figurines, or what have been called dolls, that have often displayed ornate and naturalistic personal adornments, including amulet straps, beaded headbands and charm bands, and permanent body markings that have counterparts in recent history and practice. 
In the historic period, similar human figurines were employed on St. Lawrence Island to perform a variety of tasks, including assisting individuals in weather forecasting and fertility ceremonies. Others were used as personal assistants to help their owners with various tasks, such as in hunting. Another category of human figurines in use on St. Lawrence Island and around Bering Strait was the shaman's doll or helper spirit, which was often a deceased ancestor. They were deployed to forecast the future, cure infertility problems, retrieve the lost souls of individuals, and or fight evil spirits, amongst many other things. These dolls were believed to be animated by souls or by one soul, and thus it was very important to render these powerful objects realistically so that facial features, personal tattoos, even hunting visors, and ceremonial outer garments were crafted with precision because ancestral helping spirits were attracted by and pleased by beautiful things. And if these dolls were individual representations of powerful and perhaps even named ancestors, then it would have been extremely important to capture their unique portraits as well as their tattoos. Although the visual language of prehistoric Old Bering Sea and Punic tattoo iconography and ornamentation can no longer be read precisely, fundamental themes in this material culture have been identified based on the ethnographic record, thereby connecting the worldview and spiritual practices of these ancient peoples to their contemporary descendants. Today, I will move our attention to these ivory figurines with a special focus on those that are tattooed. Drawing upon ethnographic data recorded in the 19th and early 20th centuries among the Yupik peoples of St. Lawrence Island and neighboring Chukotka, not to mention my own field work on St. Lawrence Island that began more than 20 years ago when I was a graduate student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, we will explore the many facets of ancient tattooing in the Arctic that was linked to ceremony, shamanic performance and healing, hunting rights, tribal identity, therapeutic medicine, among other things. Now, for some quick background. I've been studying Arctic tattooing traditions since the mid 1990s, and it was at this time in 1997 that I first traveled to St. Lawrence Island to interview the last generation of Yupik tattoo bearers, eight women in their late 80s and early 90s for my master's thesis in anthropology. Although there once was a male tradition of tattooing here, it disappeared many decades ago due to missionization, which took hold of the island around 1900. At the time of my visit, all of these women, including the last living tattoo artist and designer Alice Yavasuk, who was nearly 100 years of age, were marked via the traditional and painful technique of skin stitching or needle and thread tattooing. It took many sittings with a female artisan to create these lasting designs, and because of the pain associated with the act, several years would elapse before a woman acquired a full complement of designs that were related to her clan affiliation, family accomplishments, rite of passage ceremonies, marks designed to magically enhance a woman's fertility, or to repel evil spirits that were the harbingers of disease, among other things. These elderly women were very proud of their tattoo heritage and happy that I was recording their knowledge. But at the same time, they were also saddened because at that time, they knew that they were the last generation of women to carry this 2000 plus year old tradition on their bodies. But now there's obviously a revival that's taking place. But in 1997, there was a lot of doubt that that would never happen. One elder, then 94-year-old Anna Oktakayak, pictured here, who was the younger sister of Alice the Tattooist, told me it was tattooing that made her a true woman in the eyes of her community. And she noted that the tattoos on her cheeks, which she called Kilak, or the heavens, would travel with her to the afterlife so that she could meet her ancestors. 
indeed, in a recent April 7th, 2021 interview, which was just a couple of weeks ago, um, I spoke with St. Lawrence Island elder Dora Bouchea, or Umara, and she told me about her grandmother, her tattooed grandmother, Betty Naupahook, who was a sister-in-law to Anna and Alice the tattooist. And what she said is that the three lines of tattooing on a woman's cheek represented the northern lights, while the circular elements and lines symbolized the heavens, earth, and water. The northern lights were important, she said, because in St. Lawrence Island belief, they dance and are in constant motion in the sky because they are departed souls that haven't returned to the human plane and are restless. They watch and wait for a new child to be born, which they may enter to become reincarnated as another human being. Now, the cheek lines I just mentioned first appeared long ago in the tattooing traditions of St. Lawrence Island. When the prehistoric Punic people arrived on St. Lawrence Island about 1200 years ago from Asia to subsume the ancestral old Bering Sea people who lived there before them, Punic women carried these tattoos as can be seen here in this slide on two ivory doll heads which feature linear and point to linear bands of tattooing on the cheeks and which also crossed the forehead in a V-shaped design. Around 1200 AD, the Punic merged into a late prehistoric Inuit culture called the Thule of North Alaska, which today is widely accepted as most likely ancestral to the peoples of West and East Greenland and the Canadian Arctic. Now, as the Thule moved eastward across the Northern Arctic from Bering Strait, they carried their tattooing traditions with them. And in the historic period, this ancient V-shaped style forehead tattooing was commonly worn across the Canadian Arctic by the Avalingmute, Natsalingmute, among others. Today, this pattern is also worn by dozens of Inuit women in Nunavut and elsewhere who have revived these time-worn practices. Apart from my previous comments on the three tattooed lines on the cheeks of St. Lawrence Island, Yupik, Siberian Yupik and Siberian Chukchi groups, I would like to relate more information on these tattoos, which were also common in the prehistoric period of Bering Strait, as evidenced by the Punic ivory doll head pictured here once again. The cheek bands on the woman in this slide likely represent charms against infertility. Estelle Azivasuk, a female elder living in Gamble Village, St. Lawrence Island, told me a story in 1997 about Aningoan, a girl from the extinct village of Kukuluk on the northeastern cape of St. Lawrence Island. Aningoan refused to get her cheek tattoo marks because of, of the accompanying pain and she never received them. Sadly, she could not bear healthy children and as a result, they all died as infants. Distraught over the loss of her offspring, she finally agreed to become tattooed and according to Estelle, when she got some marks, she had children and they lived into adulthood. Of course, long ago, the pioneering Russian ethnographer Valdemar Borderes noted circa 1900 that these three lines were also fertility charms for the Chukchi of neighboring Chukotka. I would now like to turn our attention to a few ancient markings on prehistoric male ivory figurines from St. Lawrence Island to show additional continuities in tattooing practice across the millennia in the Arctic. Little attention has been devoted to this subject, not to mention the tattoos of ancient ivory figurines themselves, although it's been a large part of my work for the last 20 years. Notwithstanding, in the historic period in Bering Strait, as well as in the Canadian Arctic, one of the most important tattoos worn by men were facial markings related to their exploits during whale hunting or warfare. Around 1910, the Arctic explorer and ethnologist Wilhelmer Stephenson recorded that Kitlernimut, or Copper Inuit um, men, who had killed another man or whale, were entitled to two lines, two tattoo lines across the face. If a whale had been killed, the man had a line tattooed from the corners of the mouth to the lobes of the ears. 
But if a non-Inuit man had been killed, the tattoo lines were from the bridge of the nose to the ears. Elsewhere, Stephenson recorded that it was usual for the man who killed the whale to wear two lines running from the corners of the mouth to the angle of the lower jaw below and in front of the ears, a practice also observed in Bering Strait and the North Slope of Alaska. For example, in the Diomede Islands of Bering Strait and at Point Barrow on Alaska's North Slope, successful whaleboat captains and harpooners wore facial tattoos comprised of many indistinct lines or dots. These markings either resembled a broad band across each cheek from the corners of the mouth toward the ear, or one or two tattooed lines formed by dots that began below the nostrils and moved upward across each cheek, as seen here in the drawing of Anupiat whaler Amayun, who happens to be the great-great-grandfather of my colleague and contemporary whaler, Kayan Hacharik of Point Barrow, Alaska. In these cases, a new line or dot was added for every whale struck with the harpoon, and the markings formed a kind of tally. At the village of Nuwuk, just north of Barrow, Alaska, another man was seen in the 1880s with a narrow line across the face over the bridge of the nose, and he had killed a man. Both of these tattooing traditions, tallies for whaling and marks of honor for warfare, were apparently practiced for thousands of years. And I should note here that an example of this, what was described as war tattooing, across the bridge of the nose was photographed as late as 1903 among the Avalingmute of the Canadian Arctic by Albert P. Lowe. And I believe this photograph is perhaps the only known historic example of this ancient tradition. Whaling tally marks also took other forms in Bering Strait and neighboring Siberia and might also be worn by women. For example, Siberian Yupik women wore cheek markings based on a whale's fluke tails, which publicly denoted her family's hunting prowess. This tradition can also be seen on ancient ivory dolls, such as an example shown here of an old Bering Sea culture female figurine with one Y-shaped fluke tail on each of its cheeks. Around 1815, the French artist Ludovic Choris visited St. Lawrence Island and neighboring Chukotka. He sketched several men with similar Y-shaped facial tattoos on their cheeks and faces, which presumably were whale tally marks, although he didn't really describe them in any detail whatsoever, which is unfortunate. It should be noted here that several St. Lawrence Islanders told me in the 1990s that women could also be great harpooners of whales. Perhaps the most famous was Umki of Southwest Cape, of the Southwestern Cape community of Pawuliak. Um, her father did not have any sons, only daughters, and he recruited them to work on his whaling crew. Umki distinguished herself by making several kills over her career, and as a result, I was told she was tattooed on her back and chest with tattoos denoting her great status. I was not provided with descriptions of what they look like, only that she had several forms of tattooing on these parts of her body. Now, interestingly, earlier, um, well, in April, I guess just a few weeks ago, I was speaking with my St. Lawrence Island colleagues about her. Um, I was told that a woman with the same name, who also might be the same whaler I just spoke about, who elders were informing me uh, about her exploits in the 1990s, she died in a challenge against another woman from Kialagek, which is also um, an ancestral community on the southeastern Cape of St. Lawrence Island, but it was wiped out, about 95% of the population was wiped out in a great famine that took place in 1880, 1881. However, due to her great spiritual power, this Umki came back to life and even bore children afterwards, and ultimately, she won the challenge against the other woman from Hialegak. Now, in closing this section, it has always struck me um, since the 1990s when I began conducting this research that the V-shaped tattooing seen on ancient female dolls from Bering Strait, like this example in the slide, similar tattooing seen on historic women from the Canadian Arctic, as well as in Greenland, 
especially as evidenced by the Kalakatuk mummies of West Greenland, pictured here, or some of them, resemble one large fluke or tail covering the face. Now, Bering Strait myths tell us that the spirit and life force of a whale is a young woman, and facial tattoos of whale flukes likely reinforce the symbolism. However, in the St. Lawrence Island and Siberian Yupik area, women also painted their faces in ritual ceremonies in order to imitate, venerate, honor, and or attract those animals that will bring good fortune to the family. Valdemar Borger has noted this long ago, writing, it is a mistake to think that women are weaker than men in hunting pursuits, since as a man wanders in vain about the sea and wilderness, searching, women who sit by the seal oil lamp are really strong, for they know how to call the game animals to the shore. In these connections, it seems that a woman's facial tattoos assured a kind of spiritual permanency because sea mammals, as well as important deities, which I'm gonna speak about in a second, were attracted by beautiful things, including well-executed tattooing. In turn, a woman's facial tattoos lured into the house a part of the land and or the sea, and along with that, part of its animal and spiritual life. And it was the performance of domestic activities like butchering meat and cooking it into edible food, sewing and creating sturdy and beautiful clothing from game animals that also attracted them. And in this sense, a woman's ritual position as wife the hunter became solidified in Arctic culture. Now, although Old Bering Sea and St. Lawrence Island Yupik women of the historic period wore charm bands or amulet straps on their bodies to assist them in bringing game animals home, among other things, beautifully executed tattoos were necessary for ensuring one safe passage into the afterlife which was presided over by a powerful female deity who controlled the movements of the sea mammals. Known by various names across the Arctic, like Sedna, Nuliajuk, Talilajuk, Tukanaluk, etc., the sea goddess had many names because people were afraid to utter her actual name. So people would refer to her with descriptive names instead. For example, the Danish anthropologist and explorer Nude Rasmussen noted, Indeed, they are afraid to utter the name of Nuliajuk and simply say, Takana, the one down there. The mistress of the sea controlled the sea mammals because they originally sprang from her severed finger joints, a myth which is widely distributed across Inuit cultures. Thus, great significance was attached to the hand tattooing of women, especially in former days, wrote Rasmussen. For the woman who had handsome tattooing always got on well with the sea goddess when, after life on earth, she passed her house on the way to the land of the dead. Or in other words, women had to have beautifully tattooed hands to please her. After death, one passed through her dwelling place on the way to the afterlife. In her groundbreaking 2010 documentary, Tunit, Retracing the Lines of Inuit Tattoos, Alethea Arnakuk Varil interviewed Natsalingmute elders who remembered this tradition. I have heard that the ones with tattoos will rise and go to a better place, one elder explained. Another stated, they are given a path to get to a happier place, and the ones without tattoos, they'll be stuck underneath with no way up to a better place, as I've heard. Other elders told Arnakuk Varil that tattooing was a painful practice and not everyone could endure it and follow through with the entire process. So to scare her into it, they tell her, if you're not tattooed, you'll end up in Nakurmute, the underworld. Historical drawings and photographs demonstrate that Inuit women across the Canadian Arctic often had one or two, sometimes three, black bands of tattooing on their first and second finger joints precisely in the same locations where the sea goddess's fingers were cut off in myth to give rise to the sea mammals. A prehistoric mummy of the old Bering Sea culture of St. Lawrence Island, radiocarbon dated to approximately 1600 years ago, also had two rows of tattooed dots just below her knuckles, as did the digits of East Greenlandic women in Amasalik. 
I believe there is a connection between all of these forms of finger tattooing and the story of the sea mistress's severed fingers, and that these ancient tattooing traditions serve to honor her and perhaps the game animals, while also helping women to recount the ancient tale in order to keep it in collective memory. But just as a woman's tattoos were part of her spiritual connection to the deities, they also marked an individual's connection to her ancestors and perhaps even one's soul. After filmmaker Alethea Arnakuk Burrill received her hand and facial tattoos, she recounted to me in a 2012 conversation she had with her great aunt, who said, oh, I see that you have identifiers now. Arnakuk Burrill explained, now, she didn't mean that they, the tattoos, meant I was from a small town. They meant that I was spiritually marked. Many elders told me that your tattoos stay with your soul after you die, so when you pass on, you can recognize your family based on the tattoos they carried into the afterlife. While she was filming Tanit, several elders told Arnakuk Burrill that most female tattoos were symmetrical as they came to find their place in the skin, but those that were asymmetrical were for luck or protection because they worked as charmed amulets. For example, a story was recounted about a Kit Lernimu Indian woman who was having difficulty conceiving children. As a remedy, a stick-like figure was placed just above her knee as a fertility charm, and it worked. She had many children. Among the St. Lawrence Island and Siberian Yupik people, these stick-like figurines were called yugak, or powerful person, and were guardian spirits and protected individuals from evil spirits associated with the land and sea, future disasters, the spirits of strangers, the spirits of the dead, and those spirits associated with unknown areas where one had not previously traveled. Sometimes glossed as amulets, or as I mentioned, guardians, these tattoos embodied ancestral or other protective spirits that revealed themselves to their human counterpart in dreams or visions or through shamanic consultation. While I, when I interviewed St. Lawrence Island elders about these kinds of tattoos in 1997, I was given the following information. Alice Yavasuk, the tattoo artist, said of them, sometimes when a mother loses her child, a baby, they do that kind of tattooing when they keep dying because the yugak of a new mother was believed to protect infants from evil influences. Mabel Tooley of Savunga said her aunt had a little man tattoo to scare the spirits away while she was sleeping. These are for protection. St. Lawrence Island local historian Paul Saluk stated in the 1950s that his father had a small figure of a man tattooed on each upper arm. He had these placed on his body after four of his sons had died to change his luck in this regard. Among the Siberian Chukchi, warriors were tattooed with stick-like figures on their shoulders in hopes of capturing the soul of their victim, thus transforming it into a kind of supernatural assistant by drawing upon its power. Now, I have, I've been thinking about these tattoos for a long, long time and um, sort of developed a theory about these anthropomorphic stick men, stick person tattoos. Um, and it is really derived from the deployment of other amuletic objects, especially anthropomorphic charms carved out of wood or ivory, which were utilized across the circumpolar north in prehistoric and historic times to repel evil spirits among other things. Now, these types of charms carved into wood or ivory were believed to be sentient and they were animated by souls housed in their wooden or ivory bodies. And sometimes they were fed with tallow, tobacco, and other substances to keep them happy. Among the Siberian Chukchi, St. Lawrence Island and Siberian Yupik peoples, these charms were supposed to, in times of need, to turn into living beings and provide the required assistance. However, they could also provide their human owner with the body or appearance of a spirit who would therefore see that person as a fellow spirit being as opposed to some form of human prey 
and therefore they would leave that individual alone. Because these wooden or ivy amulets could break loose from the straps or bindings holding them close to the body and become lost, a tradition evolved whereby they were tattooed on the body to make them permanent. Thus, an individual who carries anthropomorphic tattoos of stick-like figures on their body became, from an ideological standpoint, one with the spirits of disease, disaster, infertility, death, and so on, through mimic mimicking their appearance. And because spirits could possess human or semi-human form, I see no reason why they were not also tattooed like humans. Because after all, and as I will explain a bit later, spirits were believed to live in communities much like humans and even possess their own magical charms. Therefore, therefore some tattooing practices in the Arctic could have evolved from this concept whereby humans adopted forms or styles of tattooing believed to be worn by spirits so that they would not attack them because spirits saw tattooed humans as fellow spirits. But before I visit these concepts again, I would like to briefly speak about therapeutic tattoos and tattoo pigments as prepared on St. Lawrence Island. <clears throat> Lamp back, sorry, excuse me, lamp black was the primary tattoo pigment used to darken the sinew thread for skin stitching. Soot or lamp black produced a deep blue black color and it was also believed to be highly efficacious or effective against spirits. However, fine dark graphite was also used. Graphite was a magical substance obtained through barter from neighboring Siberia. It was called the stone spirit because it guarded humankind from evil spirits, spirits and the sicknesses brought by them. These substances were combined with human urine to mix the tattoo pigment. And across the Arctic, urine was considered as an apotropaic or evil averting substance suitable for tattooing and other rituals because it repelled many forms of alien spirits, like, um, sorry, alien entities, like spirits, not aliens. Um, they also, urine is also believed to repel strangers, the dead, and numerous species of dangerous fauna. Now, therapeutic tattoos were usually placed upon the seat of injury or on other bodily locations considered to be susceptible or affected by malevolent entities. Some maladies were cured by St. Lawrence Island shamans. Uh, one 1935 account that I found stated, a mark over the sternum is the shaman's cure for heart trouble. A small mark over each eye, the cure for eye trouble. Various other small marks on the body are used as remedies from time to time by the shaman. St. Lawrence Island Yupik historian Paul Saluk referred to these latter treatments. If his head aches, always he should have a tattoo in front of his ears. Thus, two lines illustrated near the corners of the eye of a St. Lawrence Island man seen in the late 19th century, seen on the slide, probably represented one of these types of medicinal marking. Similar tattoos are also present on prehistoric Old Bering Sea and Punic culture ivory carvings or dolls from the island. In the Bering Strait region, a Diomede Island man illustrated with tattooed marks on either cheek, close to the mouth, others on the temple, and two more on the forehead, resembling triangular bodied anthropomorphs, were explained as medicine at the turn of the 20th century. Brass tattoos were also an important part of ancient tattoo traditions in Bering Strait and across the Arctic through the historic period. Although St. Lawrence Islanders could not relate any information to me concerning these practices, Old Bering Sea and Punic dolls, which I've actually held in my hand and investigated, like the one in the slide, from the island display such markings. Reviewing ethnographic reports from other areas, Chugach Inuit women, Inuit women of mainland Alaska were tattooed on the breast to stimulate milk secretion. Danish ethnologist Gustav Holm reported around 1900 that East Greenlanders at Amasalik now and then resort to tattooing in cases of sickness. And nearly all the women have a couple of short lines between the eyebrows 
and one just below the root of the nose or on and between the breasts. Now, I will imply here that these particular linear tattoos on the breast had a therapeutic purpose. Photographs of East Greenland and Canadian Inuit women depict unilateral tattooing of the breast with the dotted marks placed just above the nipple used for breastfeeding. So perhaps these marks helped induce an increased flow of mother's milk, but I have not actually found a precise description attesting to that. Um, it's just sort of a postulation I have. Now an individual's primary joints were another important location for tattooing preventive spiritualistic medicine. The Yupik people of St. Lawrence Island and neighboring Siberia, like many circumpolar and indigenous peoples around the world, regard living bodies as inhabited by multiple souls, each soul residing in a particular joint, limb, or body point. For the most part, disease and sickness was attributed to the loss of one or more of these souls due to infiltrating spirits. On St. Lawrence Island, soul loss was explained to me as a gradual sickening of the limb, followed by debilitating arthrosis, disordered behavior, eye troubles, and possibly death. From this perspective, bodily joints and points housing limb or joint souls ultimately served as the highways which malevolent entities traveled to enter the human body in an attempt to injure it. From this perspective, it should not be too surprising that joint marking once had significant importance on St. Lawrence Island during funerary events and after a hunter's first major kill. Funerary tattoos called naflu and first kill tattoos called kakalek consisted of small dots placed at the convergence of various joints, as seen in this illustration here. Shoulders, elbows, hip, wrist, knee, ankle, neck, and waist joints. For applying them, the female tattooist, in cases of both men and women, used a large skin sewing needle dipped into the aforementioned tattoo pigment of urine lamp black and graphite, which were all despised by spirits. On St. Lawrence Island, the death of any member of a village or even a large game animal like a polar bear, whale, walrus, was characterized as a dangerous time in which the living could become possessed by the shade or potentially malevolent spirit of the deceased. And because pallbearers and hunters were in direct contact with the dead, they were tattooed at their primary joints as a form of protection, since as noted, these joints were either, these joints were the spiritual highways into the body. Receipt of these indelible tattoos, these indelible marks, impeded future instances of spirit possession and debilitating arthrosis at these vulnerable passageways, locations equated with physical and spiritual movement between worlds. Interestingly, many of these points also line up with classical acupuncture points for arthrosis. And this is a topic I covered in my first published journal article in 1999. As I'm drawing this lecture to a close, I want to briefly speak about the afterlife and the breakage of many of the ancient dolls I have spoken about today. If you remember in previous slides, many of the ancient doll heads we have reviewed today were dismembered from their bodies. We believe that this was a purposeful action and was performed when the owner of the doll or figure died. The action of destroying the personal property of the dead was fairly widespread across the Yupik region and especially on St. Lawrence Island. There actually was a location on top of the mountain above Gamble called the Destroying Place specifically for this. It was also where the cemetery was located. Um, these traditions have led art historians, anthropologists, and others to suggest that the dismemberment or decapitation of ancient Old Bering Sea and later Punic human figures may have been performed during funerary rituals, whereby the figure was killed, presumably to release any potential malignant powers manifested in them to forestall their reanimation by evil spirits after the death of the owner, or to simply release the spirit of the object because they were after all animated by souls, 
so that that soul essence could accompany the owner to the afterlife. Now, all, some, or none of these hypotheses could, might be correct. However, it is known that in the Yupik land of the dead, everything is reversed. So when an object of a dead person was broken, it was thought to become whole again in the afterlife. According to Bering Strait Yupik concepts of the afterlife, the land of the dead was seen as similar to that of the living. But in many ways, this world was turned inside out and upside down. In a myth recorded by Siberian Yupik elder Tassan Tain, the deceased lived in villages with their dogs. Their cemeteries contained dwellings instead of graves, and when a human died, the ancestors held a festival to celebrate. Thus, decapitation or dull breakage was necessary so that these figures could become whole again in the afterlife. There, they would find renewed use in the world of ancestral spirits who were believed to employ their own guardian and other magical figurines to repel evil, among other things. As noted earlier, some of these ancient dolls were perforated so they could be attached to the human body via amulet straps, belts, or cords. Because of the placement holes, some of these objects must have been worn upside down on the neck or body. Now, inverted figures such as these have been found worldwide and presumably they signify a deceased ancestor. That is because, as mentioned, death is an inversion of life and the afterworld was turned upside down and inside out. Now, before I complete my lecture today, however, I want to show you a very short teaser of a forthcoming Russian documentary on indigenous tattooing in Chukotka, which is still worn by a few Siberian Yupik and maritime Chukchi women. Now, I really look forward to learning more about the functions of tattooing in this documentary as told by living tattoo bearers, local historians, and the filmmakers themselves, who may be watching, I believe, in a faraway place like St. Petersburg. <laughs> um, but let me show it. It's very short. The clip, that is. Tetera, 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 Самой мне было плохо, зачем я пошла? Я даже не помню, может, я один. Одна иголка. Um, that concludes uh, my lecture, but I'd just like to point out, um, although there was not a lot of information um, in that particular clip, it does remind me of uh, perhaps the last living traditionally tattooed St. Lawrence Island Yupik elder, Mabel Tooley. And she also was tattooed with uh, at Noun, which are the two, um, the first tattoos that a woman, a young girl would receive on her, the bridge of her nose. And she also received those without parental consent and as a very young woman in her teens. And she did so because she told me that she, she was jealous of her tattooed girlfriends. Um, and, and when she came home, her parents were, made her to feel very ashamed of her tattoos because they were devout Christians. And she told me that she cried for days and days because of their reaction to her tattoos. Um, but it sort of reminds me of what that elder was saying. Um, but that's all I have, um, but I'm happy to take your questions if you have any or your concerns. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very interesting. A lot of information. I've been also taping this lecture and I think it would be nice for me anyhow to see it again because it's so much information. It was very interesting. Um, maybe somebody has a question. You can either raise your hand. I have some in the chat from the beginning. Maybe, I don't know, I will see what that says. 
Um, I cannot hear the voice output. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I hope I hope we could hear it uh, with other people, but no one's chiming in, so that would be tragic. Okay, I have a question from Tertonic. No, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I ask you to unmute yourself, and then you can ask the question. I hope it works. Oh. Hello, Terto. I think she unmuted. I think she. Hello. Hi, I can hear it now. I can hear you now. Can we? Yeah, we can hear you as well. Welcome. Really great. Thank you. Sorry. So. Hello. Hello. Yeah. I don't have any, any further questions at the moment. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. I just had uh, some few problems, issues with having uh, the voice out from the beginning. Very interesting um, topic. Thank you. I just would like to listen now uh, for other questions. Okay. Um, I do have something to mention to you because we were involved with a chat on um, one of your recent publications, um, which I have, I just bought that book. Um, and you had a question via academia.edu for all of you yeah. that are out there. Um, you had a question about the language that might have been used when uh, a, a Yupik tattooist was, was giving tattoos, if, if they used a special language, if they had any words to say with the tattoos, and I didn't forget that you asked that question. Um, sadly, um, when, when I asked about that, because I was aware of words being said um, based on the testimony of a Siberian Yupik man um, who was tattooed probably around 1895, who migrated to St. Lawrence Island, which it's sort of a dangerous passing, but I mean, it's only like 15, it's like 30 miles, you can see actually Siberia from St. Lawrence Island on a clear day. Um, and, and he just mentioned in this, this document, when, uh, like his life story in 1940, that, that the tattooist did have, he said, basically, the tattooist has a word to say with every stitch, but um, unfortunately, the rest was lost in translation. We don't know if she was speaking in sort of like a, a special language, um, you know, that, that most people wouldn't understand. If that tattooist herself was also a shaman who might be speaking in a different uh, sh spiritualistic language. Um, and then when I interviewed Alice Javasuk, the last living design, uh, tattoo artist in St. Lawrence Island, she didn't say anything about, um, you know, making any prayers or offerings or saying anything as she tattooed. Apart from that, you know, this will make you look beautiful. Um, you know, get, you'll get through it. You'll find a husband. You know, that, those types of sort of common, you know, remarks. Um, but nothing about the spirits. But then again, um, a lot of uh, elders, since I was an outsider and it was my first visit to the island, um, they didn't want to speak about the shamanic religion, the previous practices prior to Christianity, because at that time, you know, 90 95% of the population were, were Christian. And so they didn't want to go into the spiritual concepts of tattooing per se. Um, and so there might have been something there, um, but she didn't want to share it with me. I mean, I also queried other elders about it, other ones that had been tattooed in the 1920s and the 1930s. And none of them also mentioned anything about, you know, specific like taboos or um, you know, spiritualistic language that was being used. But I have an inkling that, that there was maybe previous to this time period, so perhaps in the late 19th century, um, based on the testimony of this one particular guy named Sweeney, who was from, from the Siberian side. And I, I, but then again, you know, there was language difficulties, obviously, because he was, he was being transcribed not in his native language, and it was like a second language English, and this was in 1940 by a a psychologist, Dorothea Layton, who also was sort of an anthropologist doing these life story studies. So I, I think that there's more there. My guess is that that there was, um, there was sort of like a spiritualistic language or, or, you know, some kind of calling out to other entities, perhaps the, the spirit, the spiritual helpers of if, if this woman was a shaman and also a tattooist. And I would look probably towards the works of, of Bogoraz because he did capture some of that um, language, I guess, in his interviews with shamans, but not in particular reference to tattooing. I mean, he was sort of interested in tattooing, but not so much. I mean, he'd recorded some valuable information, but there could be something in there. I mean, it, his work is exhaustive. Um, and of course, there's a lot of it that's unpublished and that's in Russian archives. 
And then of course, Sergei Rodenko, famous archeologist who, who discovered the Pazurk tattooed mummies and I referenced one drawing. He also wrote an important article in the 1940s about Siberian Yupik tattooing in Chukotka. And he took many photographs, but most of them, I don't think any of them were really published, but um, I have to dig through my notes, but I know that his field notes, are, I think they're in Moscow. Um, I think that there could be some great information in there that has not been sifted through. So he was a very meticulous observer. He was also very interested in tattooing. Um, he worked with other Siberian groups and wrote articles about their tattooing even previous to that article in the 1920s. I can think of some other ones. Um, so there could be something there that is sort of an untapped resource um, if those, those files can be found. Um, but anyway, just throw that out there. Okay, well, thank you for this answered question, which <laughs> was previously uh, asked. Terto, have you heard the answer? Yes, I've got this uh, long and explanative uh, answer. Um, I was just, um, well, here in Greenland, we do have the lists of the uh, spirit languages, which is pretty ignored um, and referred to as a spiritual, uh, kind of spiritualist language or something like that. But it is not a kind of a spiritualist language. It is a language because I was, um, I'm dealing with the cultures of the uh, the Dona, the helper spirits, and the uh, the uh, the culture that is existing by itself, and where is you are using a particular language if you are a initiating to become a shaman apprentice that you have to learn this uh, the second language um, of, 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 of this uh, intellectuality of the spirits and especially in the western scholars among the western scholars and understanding and perceivement of the spirits is that it's like untouchable uh, like air um, imaginative um, philosophical based Whilst for us among, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, um, in the traditional Inuit of Karajit of Greenland, it is that they live with these, uh, with these uh, entities or with these uh, creatures. They live with these, sometimes they can touch them and sometimes they do have bodies. They have a, an extended um, culture. And so I was thinking about that you cannot, when you do the tattooing, uh, you must have, um, you, you came also last, came into this uh, subject, uh, that when they get connected to the spiritual world, then, um, then for example, they use these, um, the sot of the, and, and they do with their thread and then uh, putting it through under the skin. So the, um, so the sot, uh, the sod, the black, the sod that is uh, burnt because it's burnt, it cannot be burnt no longer. That's why the uh, spirit, uh, bad spirit, evil spirit cannot go through uh, this area of the person. Uh, and th this, it, it's not just to make the color or the coloring of the underskin, it is to protect uh, the carrier of the soot, and because the soot, the soot, S-O-D, it is, um, it cannot be, it can't burn no longer. And when you're talking about the urine and uh, urination and urine and the blubber or the, uh, the uh, tallow, it also refers to, uh, into a shaman, traditional shaman um, um, protection mm -hmm. or, uh, ignorance or avoidance. So we do have all these um, uh, 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 carriers uh, points why they are used. So it's not from, it's not just to um, make person um, beautiful or protected right. uh, towards the spirits or to be more, uh, whatever um 
to but, resemble the spirit. I mean, yeah. Yeah, they, all these things have uh, implications. Um, how they are done, and what I'm missing in when I look at your uh, writings is even among the other people of Amazonian people you have studied, if they do use particular language, because we still do have this. I mean, still do not still do, but we do have this magic language uh, that will be used to many things before an action is taking place, especially if the um, tattooing is to cure or to, to whatever. What kind of language has been used is what I'm interested to know among the, um, the Amazonian people as well. Did, do, do, do they did that? Did they do that? Um, well, I'm not, I've only really conducted research with one indigenous group in Amazonia. I mean, I can think of other groups in Southeast Asia that I've worked with, like the Iban, um, who are heavily tattooed, and especially the Kayan. Um, I know more about sort of their spiritual, spiritualistic traditions related to tattooing, and there's a lot of taboos surrounding it. And each tattooist worked under the tutelage or guidance of two specific deities associated with tattooing amongst the Kayan. And there was an elaborate ritual that took place prior to the tattooing. And I have testimony from a, a particular shaman who knows, a, 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 who knew a lot of it, she's passed away. And she provided excerpts of some of that language, which was not readily understood by the, the, the populace or even the person that was being tattooed. So it was like this, you know, language that you're speaking about. Um, I have not published on that, but I'm actually, well, I'm writing a big book on Southeast Asian indigenous tattooing right now. So uh, aspects of that will be in the book, is including the, the ritual that take place. And, and from my understanding, I haven't really encountered um, any literature that actually describes it in as much detail as that I was given. And, um, but I, I, I agree with you because I, I know that I know of these languages occurring in other indigenous groups not necessarily connected to tattooing, but perhaps it was, it just wasn't recorded because it wasn't understood by the ethnographers or the explorers who were there because A, they didn't speak the indigenous language and they certainly did, wouldn't understand what, what this, this language that wasn't known to many people, you know, in a local community, only a, the sacred few that would know it. Um, but um, yeah, I, uh, that's sort of my answer. I mean, it's sort of an unknown, thing to me, you know, at this point. So I can't give you a, a specific examples from the Arctic, we'll put it that way. Um, thank you, Terto. There are also more questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, let me see, I have some in the chat. Um, oops. Um, oh, that is, um, oops. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Now that is recorded, uh, how did they prevent infection from tattoos? Asked Catherine Berger. Well, A, urine has a high ammonia content. So I was always, it was always described to me. I mean, it helps, um, it helps with healing just because of the ammonia in it. Um, I mean, also I was told that some individuals would, did die as a result of tattooing. Um, but that also could have been because of steel needles and blood poisoning, not necessarily, you know, using the you know, bone needles, you know, prior to the arrival of trade goods. Um, yeah. But I get, but I got also got to tell you that I know from experience, skin stitch tattoos heal very quickly. I mean, they're not major incisions; they're they're pretty small. It takes a long, long time to get a full complement of tattoos, but it's not like you're using. Um, you know, uh, a hand tapping tool where uh, or you're covering large uh, portions of the body. So I think it would have been very rare for someone to actually have you know, died. I and mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there were infections, but, um, but I, I know that some of the fastest tattoos I've ever received, I mean, as far as from a healing standpoint, were, were skin stitch tattoos, just because you're not covering, you know, you're, you're not incising the body so much, the, the area, it's, 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 tiny little stitches, you know, and over time, the ink spreads under the skin, and that's when the tattoos become linear. Um, but there's not a lot of trauma to the body, put it that way, as compared to other, you know, techniques where there's, you know, large sections of the body being tattooed at one point in time, which, you know, increases your possibility of getting, you know, an infection. 
or uh, sepsis or yeah. <laughs> um, I have another question from Kimberly Bolter. Uh, some of the female dolls have what looks like a line across the pelvis hips. Was that something med medical or for luck with pregnancy? Well, a lot of those, I think of some of those ones you're referring to, if I'm not mistaken, um, they're actually, there were some forms of undergarments um, that were worn. And I, that's pretty much outlining uh, what I believe is to be that garment. Now, of course, there is a well-documented tradition of thigh tattooing across the Arctic area. Um, and there are many different stories and reasons and meanings behind that. Oftentimes it's related to, you know, something. So when a, when a child's first born, the first thing they see is something of beauty. Um, but I think in, in some of the cases of the dolls, that, that could be the outline of an undergarment, um, not necessarily a tattoo, because there are a lot of marks placed on some of the prehistoric dolls that people have mistaken, I believe, as tattooing, where in fact they're probably a ceremonial garment um, or a form of outer clothing or a parka um, and not necessarily tattooing. Um, but it takes, you know, it, it's as comparing the ethnographic record to, you know, known material culture and then looking at these dolls figurines carefully um, to deduce that. And sometimes that we cannot we cannot deduce if that is tattooing or not. I, I would suspect there probably was more expansive tattooing in the past, um, but there's so much that was not recorded in the historic era that we just don't know. Um, so it's difficult to sort of answer some of those specific questions. Um, I have a question from Gustavo Paternina. Um, uh, I'm from Colombia. I'm a tattoo artist and anthropology student. Right now I'm working on a research about graphic expression of our pre-Hispanic and living tribes here in Colombia. It's amazing the creative and artistic coincidence, uh, if we might call it that, around the intention of graphics into metal, ceram ceramics and skin. My question, and we really talk about an intention when it comes to the graphic expression that we can recognize, was there communication intention for them or for us? Can we really know? Well, I can tell you in the vast majority of indigenous languages, there was no word for artist or tattoo artist. Um, so I think the aesthetic element of it, um, I mean, I did speak about how the, the sea goddess and other spirits were attracted to beautiful things. So beautifully executed tattooing was extremely important in the Arctic. But I think that's sort of the exception to the rule because I believe in most indigenous societies I've worked with, which is the tattoo over 50, um, tattooing for aesthetic reasons um, and our sense of beautification uh, was pretty rare. Um, now, don't get me wrong, like Alice Yavasuk, the tattooist was very proud of her tattooed creations. I mean, I think if I remember correctly, she said something to the effect like, you know, she, this is not her words, but I mean, she tried to place tattoos on the facial contours of a woman to, to, en to enhance her beauty. Okay, granted. So she was very proud of, of the aesthetics of what she was creating to fit the body of her particular clients. Um, but, and, and that's, 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 you know, there are other indigenous groups that they also practice tattooing and felt the same way as a creation as you know, contouring the body and making one beautiful. But I'd say that that's pretty much an exception to the rule. And that was not the purpose. I don't know if that's exactly what the question is aimed at, but I think aesthetics are, were not extremely important around tattooing because tattooing had many more rather important functions like tribal identity, um, you know, spiritual helpers, medicine, social accomplishments, uh, right of passage tattoos, maybe, uh, rather than aesthetics. Um, that's just my belief. Of, of course, it's a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the culture um, and, de and depending on their ethos, their cosmology. But from what I can find or from what I've been researching, that's sort of the exception to the rule. Okay, I have uh, one, more, one last uh, question uh, from Lucas Kerk. Um, thank you very much for this interesting lecture. My question is as follows. Are most of the tattoos limited to body regions that can be, be seen in daily life? Due to the climate in the Arctic tattoos on all body regions except the face must have been visible only for a privileged circle of persons. 
uh, are during special events. That is at least what I assume. Or was it if this fact of minor importance as many tattoos were not used for interpersonal communication, but for communication with spirits, spirits as a medical tattoo? So, for instance, in the Arctic, I mean, we do have drawings from Chorus from 1815 on the Siberian side, where typically speaking in the winter months, it's, you know, obviously it's freezing outside. I mean, you can barely go outside for a couple of minutes and otherwise, you know, you're going to suffer, suffer from hypothermia. Um, but the insides of the semi-subterranean houses that people used to live in were extremely warm. And uh, a lot of people would congregate, they had big households. And in those drawings, um, there's little clothing being worn. Um, and you can see full compliments, because women used to have tattoos from their shoulders all the way down their arms. And again, there's, there's some evidence of breast marking and the facial tattoos. So uh, when you get into the sort of the personal space of everyday life, especially in the wintertime, um, everyone could see these tattoos. Um, so there was a lot of body coverage, actually. Um, so, uh, but, but, but then again, yes, I mean, um, in the summer months, I mean, it's sort of in the, when you're out on the landscape also in the wintertime, I mean, most of these tattoos were covered by clothing. Um, and there were very few really early, I, I think, explorers or, you know, artists in the case of Chorus, because he was a very gifted artist that actually had that intimate um, experience of actually spending a substantial amount of time in, in dwellings for, you know, I don't know, a few days at a time, but able to make these drawings. So for, for the most part, um, there's a lot of body coverage um, of tattooing in the Arctic. It's just that, you know, you, you only have a few glimpses of it from the historic, from the ethnographic record. And, and he's one of the best, but his drawings for the most part have not been really um, published apart from the ones where you actually see clothing appearing on most of the body and some tattoos on the face. But the really intimate scenes, um, have been sitting at uh, Yale University Beinecke Library for a long, long time. I published a few of them in my 2014 book, which is here in the last slide, Tattoo Traditions of Native North America. They're beautiful um, watercolors. And you can get them online too. I mean, they're, they're actually free and available to go uh, to Yale and you can download high-res copies if you'd like to see more of them. But I, I had a, a couple in here, but uh, in the lecture, but they weren't of the, the intimate scenes, you know, they were just, sketch drawings of a man with fl flute tails on his cheek and things like that. Well, thank you, uh, Lars, for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture. I think um, we could talk about it for hours. We'll do that another time, hopefully. Uh, thanks for everybody listening. Tomorrow there will be a nice lecture about Nias, starting at three, and on Monday there's another lecture about uh, beats. Um, well, thank you all for listening, and uh, well, hope to see you again. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Okay. I hope you uh, email if you need to, if you have any questions yeah. or concerns. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> All, All right. right.